we have been considering in these sessions through these weeks what God's purpose for man really was when he created man. And progressively we've been looking at God's purpose, God's provision. And now that man has fallen, how God made a way for man to be restored to that original purpose by sending Christ, giving us the Holy Spirit to dwell within. And I have repeatedly stressed how a lot of people are missing out on God's provision. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If we don't know the truth, we will remain in bondage. And that is the condition of many, many Christians. Because they are ignorant, they are bound. It's the opposite of what Jesus said. I could say, Jesus was implying, if you remain ignorant of the truth, you will remain in slavery and bound. But if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Free from sin, free from all the hang-ups you have in your personality because of tragedies you faced in your childhood or problems caused you by others. You can be set free from everything. There is not a single problem in your life that God cannot solve. There is no hangover from the past that God cannot deal with. This is the wonderful message of the gospel. It doesn't matter what your background is, where you came from, what, how you were brought up, God can solve everything and make you a glorious Christian. Make you like Christ increasingly if you are willing. You know, Jesus once used these words in Matthew 11 and verse 29. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Now, in an earlier study, we saw the exhortation in Philippians 2.5 saying, have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Have this attitude in you, which was in Christ. Now, Jesus is saying the same thing here. Learn from me, he says. Not just from a book. Do you know one big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is this? That in the Old Testament, they only had a book. No man could stand up in the Old Testament and say, follow me, look at me, learn from me. But in the New Testament, we don't only have a book, we have a person. The person of Jesus Christ, dead and risen, and the Holy Spirit to show us what Christ is like and to make us like him. Now, which do you think is easier? To learn swimming on a blackboard or to learn swimming by a person jumping into the river and showing you what to do? You know the answer. From a book, you can have all the theory of swimming explained there. You may never learn it. You still go and jump in the river, you drown. But if you have a person who's got into the river and says, see what I'm doing and follow me, it is so much easier. That is one of the big differences between the old covenant and the new covenant. In the old covenant, they had a book, the book of the law. In the new covenant, we have the word not written down, but the word made flesh. And so when we look at the written word, our purpose is through the written word of scripture to see the living word, Jesus Christ himself. And so he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. How can I learn from Christ? It's not like, like you study chemistry or physics sitting in a classroom and listening to a lecture. And you can learn chemistry, mathematics, physics, every subject in the world you can learn by sitting in a classroom. But you can't learn swimming sitting in a classroom. You can't learn horse riding sitting in a classroom. You can't learn to drive a car or a plane sitting in a classroom. That needs hands-on experience. And to become like Christ, to learn from Christ, you need experience in daily life. For that, he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, 
We know in our villages, everybody knows what a yoke is. The fields are plowed with two oxen, plowing together with a yoke upon their necks and they pull the plow together and that's how the field is plowed. And when, say, one of those bullocks dies and they get a new little bullock who doesn't know head or tail about plowing and doesn't know how to plow a straight furrow, they yoke that new junior bullock with an experienced senior bullock. And it's as it were, the senior bullock tells the junior bullock, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Just walk at the pace I'm walking, walk in the direction I'm walking. And in a few weeks, you'll be able to plow a straight furrow. You'd have learned from me. So it's not vocal communication, do this, do that. It's hands-on experience. And so when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, come into a partnership with me, into a fellowship with me. And let's learn to, let me teach you. Let me teach you something. Learn from me, from my life, from the way I live. Look at my earthly life. How do I take this yoke? I... So first of all, submit to the authority of Christ completely. In the Old Testament, to be under the yoke meant to be under someone's authority. We read in the Old Testament of the yoke of the king of Babylon. The Israelites came under that yoke. Now Jesus invites us to a very pleasant yoke because he says later on in Matthew 11, he says, my yoke is easy. It's very kind and pleasant type of yoke. It's not a heavy yoke like the yoke of the king of Babylon on the Israelites. No, it's an easy, pleasant yoke and my load is light. The Lord does not force us to do something. Anything forced, if you do it, even if it's a good thing, it becomes a dead work. Do you know in the Old Testament, they only had good works and evil works. In the New Testament, you read about good works, evil works, and in Hebrews 6, 1, and Hebrews 9.14, you read about dead works. And it says we've got to repent of dead works. We must have our dead works cleansed in the blood of Christ. What are dead works? In a very simple way, dead works are good works done with the wrong motive. I could preach, is that a good work? Sure. But if I preach for money, it's a dead work. I can sing a song in a church, good work, but if, it's sung, if it is sung in order to get some honor for myself, it's a dead work. I can give money for God's work, that's a good thing. But if I give that money because I want to get some honor for myself or I want my name to be published somewhere, it's a dead work immediately. Good works become dead works. Sinful works are already dead. But the great tragedy is where good works become dead works. And you read about that even in the Old Testament where in uh, the book of Exodus where the Lord spoke to Moses concerning the dress of Aaron. One of the things he said was that Aaron has got to have a, a plate on his forehead saying holy to the Lord. And the purpose of that, Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Exodus 28 and verse 38 was to take away the sin there is in the holy things that Israel consecrates. There is sin in the holy things. And that is dead works. So Jesus says, don't just mechanically do something written in scripture. It'll be a dead work. You can take a verse of scripture, mechanically obey it, and force other people to obey it mechanically according to the letter of the law. 2 Corinthians 3, I think is verse 6, says the letter kills. You can follow the letter of scripture and it'll kill. And you can take that letter of scripture and preach it to other people in your church, it'll kill them. That's not the way to learn. No. The way to learn is to take the yoke of Jesus upon us and to learn from him, to look at his example. So in 2 Corinthians 3, after it says that the letter will kill, do you go to the written letter of the law? 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it'll kill. He says, in contrast, the Holy Spirit gives life. So how does the Holy Spirit give life? By showing us, when we read scripture, not a verse or a commandment, but the glory of Jesus Christ. 
So in other words, when I look at scripture, I have to see Jesus there. That's what it says further down in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. With unveiled face, I look into this mirror of God's word and what do I see there? I see the glory of Jesus Christ there. And little by little, the Holy Spirit changes me into that likeness. And so we see here that the whole purpose with which God has given us the scriptures is not just for us to follow letter of the law. It'll, that'll make you a Pharisee. You know, the Pharisees who killed Jesus Christ were people who followed the letter of the law. And they kept on trying to find fault with people. They would find, catch a woman in adultery and go to the letter of the law and want to stone her to death and Jesus would set her free. Because they didn't understand the heart of God. They kept the letter of the law and they wanted to kill people, punish people. Whereas God was always interested in redeeming people. If, he, if God sees a man in sin, he wants to save that man. When the Pharisees saw a man in sin, they were considering how, which verse to use to put him out of the church. So you find there are people like that even today. When they see a person in sin, they want to find which verse is there to condemn him. Whereas when God sees a man in sin, he wants to see how he can save him. So that's an example of how the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. You go to the letter of the law and you'll find a verse to hit somebody on the head with. Whereas if you go to the Holy Spirit, he'll show you the glory of Jesus there. And if you want life, you've got to see Jesus right through scripture. And say, Lord, help me to understand your nature. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For example, if we were to look at the humility of Jesus Christ, you know, the world can see the glory of God in creation. Yeah, there's a glory there in the stars, the planets, and all the wonders there are in this universe. But to the disciple of Jesus, the glory of God is not seen in creation primarily, but in the character and person of Jesus Christ, in his humility, in his in the way he lived on this earth. When we think of the very fact that he did not consider equality with God as something to be held on to and grasped, but came down and became a man, that itself is a tremendous step in humility. I mean, just picture this. If you as a dignified human being want to help a worm a wretched worm crawling on the ground and you love that worm so much because it doesn't know how to conduct itself, you become a worm in order to get, you know, if you go to that worm as a man, the worm will be terrified. But you become a worm in order to communicate to that worm and lead it to a higher light. This is a picture of what Jesus Christ did. The difference between God and man is much greater than the difference between man and the little worm that crawls on the ground. And for me to become a worm would be a tremendous step in humility if I wanted to help that worm. For God to become a man is a million times greater step in humility. And if we don't see that, we have not seen the glory of Jesus Christ. 